and albacore tuna. This sustainable premium fish is popular in sushi restaurants around the world. But serving at home is way easier than most people imagine. Today, Rob and I will explore mouth-watering recipes and learn about albacore tuna's journey from the warm currents of the Pacific Ocean to your nation's table. I'm Robert Clark. As a chef, I have spent my entire career in the pursuit of sustainable seafood. I'm Carmen Ruiz Ilaza. As a consumer, I've made sourcing local Canadian seafood my mission. Rob and I are going to take you on a journey. We're going to meet the men and women that bring the sea to our tables. Albacore tuna has long been prized in Japan and other Asian markets, but now a large majority of Canadian albacore stays right here at home. But for many home cooks, it is still an intimidating product to use. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Today I want to demonstrate four simple ways you can easily prepare albacore tuna at home. First up, tuna melt. This dish is considered a Canadian classic, but today Rob is kicking it up a notch. So there's four loins on the tuna. What I have here are the bottom loins, and I asked for the bottom loins because they have the belly on it. Oh. And the belly is, for a lot of people, is the best part of the whole tuna. But why I like it for this particular application is because it has a lot more fat. Mm. and I'm cooking it. So I've removed the bellies off of these three loins and I'm just going to remove... I see one. that on menus and that's coveted. Like it's coveted, it's... yeah, just because it's so rich and fatty. But how did this tuna get on our table? Earlier, Rob and I headed to Sydney on Vancouver Island to meet Peter, captain of the tuna boat Optimist. Mr. Peter DeGrieff, hi, nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to meet you, Peter. <laughs> Peter's boat has a crew of three, and they've just returned after 30 days on the open water. For tuna, there would be the captain and uh, two deckhands. So what does a typical day look like fishing for tuna? For a typical day, you uh, work with a number of other vessels. Uh, so hopefully you wake up and there's a school swimming around underneath your boat. Sometimes that happens. Wow. And so you would do a circle to, to kind of just circle around and attract the fish and get them to bait. If that doesn't work, you just start driving and you try to find uh, breaks in temperature. When you see really clear blue water, that just means there's not a lot of plankton and life in the water. Whereas when you see that greeny water, that's where plankton edge, there's lots of plankton mixed in the water. So what we're trying to find is uh, that edge where the blue meets the green, kind of. Are we going to get to see your boat? Yeah. Are we allowed on your boat? Yes. My question is, how do we get How do we get the to the boat? There is a ladder. We have to wait for the tide to rise. Yeah, you make sure you catch me if I fall down that ladder, because okay. I get, oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I'm afraid oh, of, I am. Luckily, I'm not afraid of water, just heights, <laughs> just heights and ladders. Me too. I have this thing. Come on, baby. You have such a great job. I'll just sit here and watch you work. How's that? Who's going to show me around this boat? Tuna boats will go out to sea for weeks or even months at a time. Peter's boat is a troller. Trolling is a sustainable way to catch albacore, as it minimizes the bycatch of untargeted species, and it allows the fishers to return these fish to the sea. Well, this is where all the action happens. So this is where we bring in the fish. You can see the rigging. Those poles go out at a 45 degree angle. Uh, attached to them are all these lines. At the end of those lines are a jig. A colorful squid. Yeah, it looks like a colorful, uh, you know, squid or fish. Oh, this is, there's no barbs on the one. No barbed hooks. These are what we call the tuna pullers. And uh, this just wheels in the cord. We would use this winds in on the tuna puller and then we get to the that's a chain to just weight it down a little bit and this is the purlon we get to the purlon uh, that's when you just hand pull it a bit and you flip to the board 
Once it's on the landing table, uh, we have a knives right here. And this is where we would cut at the top of the gills so it releases the blood. And uh, this actually works as a de-hooker. So we run the hook around that and the fish slides down. There's water all on here. It goes down a chute and to our forward holds. The most time we ever have them on deck is about 30 minutes. And sometimes 10 minutes, they're good enough. They're, they're, they're well enough and we just, every half hour we're loading the trays. So. Freezing the tuna just as it's caught ensures that it will stay in perfect condition while the boat remains at sea. Below we have trays, we call them racks, and we have about 12 on each side and they each hold about seven or eight tuna. And uh, they're frozen on those trays in front of, uh, we actually have what they call evaporators. And we have two facing each other, so they're uh, blast units. And so they blow cold air right onto the fish. Hey guys, yeah. can I see a tuna? Can we show it? Can I see what it looks like? Because I don't think I've ever actually seen they're high speed and high they have speed. very large eyes as you can see and that's so they can uh, spot things from a pretty wow. good distance. Wow, they do have big eyes. We never see them whole like this, that's pretty seldom. They're always uh, cut up into the four loins. Right. These are the top loins and then the, the two bottom loins. So they're almost identical except the bottom loins have the, the belly on it, the belly flap which is where the most fat is, like it's so rich. And your product mostly stays in Canada? It always is delivered into Canada. So I can buy your stuff. You can buy my stuff, it, for <laughs> sure. Back in the kitchen, Rob and I continue creating four tuna dishes. This is a classic tuna melt. It's uh, mayonnaise, pickles, mustard, relish, parsley. Mm, yum. Some, in this one particular one, I put some tarragon because I love tarragon. And I'm just yeah. adding cheese, just the same as my dad did. He would put it in like a really cheap hamburger bun. God bless him. But you see the lines in the tuna, like just, oh, yeah. and you see the oil, like it's just, it's it's so good raw too. But oh, I, sashimi yeah. is my thing, yeah. but I'm very tempted. I love the idea of uh, tuna milk. <laughs> That's a very luxurious tuna yeah. milk. They are a lot faster than me, I better hustle. No, 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 I never make great. it in your kitchen, you're I guess. You're doing great. Take this out to the barbecue. Just put it under, put the lid down. Um, yep. Maybe say, uh, I don't know, one albacore, two albacore, 30 albacore. Well, like, just then, like that. Well, it's not very long. Just as soon as the cheese starts to melt a little bit, bring her back so in. So put Here, it on sorry. the barbecue, close it. Close the lid. And yeah. this is for taking it off. Yeah. So you don't okay, bring guys. Fingers. Thank okay. you. Okay, you trust me with this? I trust you with this. <laughs> Let's see how well I take directions. Go follower. <laughs> Tuna is one of the world's most popular seafoods. But not all types of tuna are as sustainable as Canadian albacore. Can you tell all your friends that I helped you? <laughs> Overfishing in other parts of the world has created endangerment concerns with many species of tuna. But the way albacore is caught and managed by the Canadian fleet ensures that what we get on our tables is a responsible choice. One man who knows lots about tuna is marine biologist Lorne Clayton. This is the North Pacific albacore tuna. It starts off in the, the other side of the ocean, uh, spawns, and the, the young tuna come here when they're two to three years old because the water is so rich here, nutritious. Then they turn around and they go back to the other side of the ocean. The tuna that we get in our waters, they come uh, to our side of the ocean in the uh, Oregon area, and they come up the coast following the warm weather, warm water. They go up maybe as far as Alaska. Then as the season changes, they turn around and they go back the other way. The season lasts from late spring to early fall. Albacore tuna is caught several days boat ride offshore. Tuna are actually a warm-blooded fish, so they loop into the cold water to feed on the nutritious food, then they follow the currents up and down the coast. Up until the early 80s, this current existed largely in international waters, which meant that the Canadian fishery competed with international fleets and had little control over the management of this resource. Now, Canada can ensure that our albacore is caught responsibly and sustainably. Every fisherman that fishes tuna in British Columbia must have albacore tuna logbook on it. Uh, they document every fish, all the bycatch, if there is any, uh, the volumes, uh, all that stuff. All of our data that's collected goes confidentially to the federal government. Uh, it is then goes confidentially as a country to the IATTC 
and there's uh, international scientists that, that monitor the populations and the harvests, and uh, that is one of the reasons why the populations are so uh, good. There are 15 different types of fish that can be legally labeled as tuna, so it's critical to know where your tuna comes from and what species it is. Also, our albacore is extremely high in omega-3 fatty acids, makes it very healthy. And so that is one of the reasons why it's gone from a basically a canned product to now a sashimi grade uh, in top scale in any restaurants around the world. I can hear the sizzle. Yum, yum. Rob and I just finished making the tuna milk. Now on to the next dish, sashimi. And uh, it's so good even without salt oh. or anything. So what I'm going to do with the sashimi, yeah, I'm just going to put a little bit of QP mayo, this, a little bit of soy on it, some cucumber, and that's going to be our sashimi. Mm. And then we have this wonderful smoked albacore. Yeah, I haven't tried smoked, I don't think. It's phenomenal. Oh. It smokes up so nicely. So I'm just serving it just with a little bit of mustard. Mustard always goes good with smokiness. This is just some pickled red onion. Mm. Just it'll add a little, uh, little sharpness and a little, uh, a little texture to the, wow. to the experience. And so pretty. And so pretty. You've got me cooking. You've got me serving. Doing a great job, Carmen. <laughs> I'm hiring you someday. Wow! Look at this, huh? Oh, wonderful. Rob and I are preparing four tuna dishes for some fishermen and their families. Two down and two to go. Chef, these were very popular. Back in the kitchen, Rob is whipping up another course. Niswa salad, new potatoes, green beans, cherry tomatoes, eggs, and of course, seared albacore tuna. Um, and we're just gonna mix that. I'm gonna put some pickled red onion. And do you pickle those yourself? Yeah. These are quail eggs. I'm going to add the quail eggs at the wow. end so that they don't get uh, too damaged up. Some fresh chives. But this salad is great for summer, especially if you're entertaining. Then, well, you're going to see how fast it takes to cook the tuna. Um, here I just have a little honey mustard vinaigrette. Mm. Put a little bit of that on. Uh, what I liked about albacore as a chef, just the ease of using, like just how how easy it is to versatile and how versatile it is. Like it, the flavors of the tuna, I mean, you can make a poke, you can marinate it, you can ceviche. Like, there's just so much you can do with it. So we're just going to toss this up in the dressing. And I wouldn't put the dressing on too much before you go to serve the salad. The only, the only thing that I sometimes do is I will uh, actually uh, marinate the potato a little bit because potato, it absorbs flavors so much and it doesn't... You know, so I sometimes do that with the potatoes. You always buy your tuna frozen because there's no other way always, it comes, right? Always. You don't want to, there's no point in buying defrosted tuna. It, it, it defrosts in two hours in your fridge. Tuna, like it just, it, there, there's no upside to buying defrosted albacore tuna. What makes Canadian albacore tuna so special? It's the fact that its core is frozen within hours of it coming out of the water and then it stays frozen until you take it out of your freezer. Companies such as Aero in South Vancouver process the frozen tuna without defrosting it. Wow! This ensures consistent quality whenever or wherever you buy it. Exactly how Aero processes frozen tuna is a bit of an industrial secret. Still frozen Still solid. Frozen. Still frozen. So we were very lucky to be let in to see their team at work. So they go that way, that way to yeah, here. Yeah. These machines remove the skin, bones, and blood line. And then the loin is carved into something we recognize at the store. Oh, yeah. Okay, Leon, thank you so much. <laughs> These are a little bit of quail eggs. They're soft boiled. Took, oh, me, this is took me hours. I started with 112 and ended up with 60. <laughs> this is a very beautiful dish. And this is just the salad part. I'm also going to grate uh, some, uh, these are Brazil nuts. 
and uh, not that I'm uh, that I'm not into food combining, or that's certainly not my specialty. But it's very healthy if you eat tuna. If you eat tuna, eat it with Brazil nuts. It makes it healthier. Spot. It looks so pretty, so fancy. Okay, so now we have some tuna. So we're gonna cook the bells, a couple of the bellies as well, so that you get to try it cooked. Shall I take this right to the barbecue? Yeah, please, thanks. Okay, here we go, next course. Now that Rob's tuna loin is defrosted, it's time for the barbecue. You, you make it look all so easy. Well, we'll see how successful I am. It's been a while. If you have a high temperature like that, it just quickly sears, sears the it, outside. Sears it, sears it, yeah. And keeps it... It caramelizes sort of the natural sugars and all the protein, mm. and then it releases from the cooking surface, whether it's a grill or whether it's a pan. Oh, that smells really good. It's Canadian albacore tuna. Oh. oh great, look at that. Eh? And it smells good, opposed to smells fishy, right? So that's why when we were at the processing plant, how, how they're they're uh, grinding off and they're trimming it down, that's to remove all those bones at that end. So my skill or my talent or my experience, all of that is irrelevant. It's you buy high quality. In my case, it's always Canadian seafood, sustainably harvested, yeah. and you can't and you can't go wrong. Like you don't you don't need to spend 40 years in the kitchen <laughs> to be able to uh, to handle a quality product like this. Maybe, uh... Perfect. Brought to you in part by Ocean Regenerative Aquaculture and CKR Seaweed. Your nation's table is brought to you in part by Liquidity Wines. Back at Lauren's patio, Rob is putting finishing touches to his seared tuna, which he has grilled whole. But what if you don't like rare tuna on your table? What all I would do is if just simply just put these on the grill just for a second. Just for a second, it's not going to be dried out. If I tried to cook this all the way through, the ah. outside would be dry before the inside was cooked. Oh, that's a clever so, trick. If you don't mind, I'm just going to slice this up here and then we'll, oh, yeah, no. then we'll lay it on the salad. And that'll still be because it's, it's as dry as if I tried to cook this the whole way through. As a general rule, especially with seafood, if, if you need to have it cooked a little bit more, the thinner it is, the better. Wow. And it's so pretty. Oh my goodness, look at you fancy. One of the guests at Lauren's table is Ian Bryce, a longtime tuna fisherman whose family is continuing the tradition. Our son Kingsley is 27 and he is running one of our two boats. Uh, he's been running it for seven years now, so he started running the boat at 20. Our younger son Alistair is 25 and he's been running uh, this boat and others, uh, our other boat, um, since he was 20 as well. So they've both been in the fishery with me since they were 10, coming out on the boat, you know, for short shifts to start. But they're they're out there right now, which is why they're not here joining us. And, and uh, I met uh, Sebastian. Yes. On your vessel, and he's just a young man, and yeah. He loves it. Oh, he absolutely does. Yeah, yeah. he uh, wants to be a fisherman. He calls himself a fisherman. Yeah, it is and, 15. Uh, he's 15, yeah. He's uh, uh, my uncle's uh, grandson. Sebastian is a seasoned fisherman, even though he's not old enough to drive. One thing I did notice, my shoulders got, my shoulders and my back got big, but I still, skin, I, I still got skinny. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm skinny everywhere except my shoulders <laughs> and my back. Because when you pull, you're just like pulling like, it's all shoulders and back. So like, at the end of the day, you're just like, oh, my back. <laughs> but then hurts. you're like, oh, nice. Yeah, Look at the mirror yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm really good at pulling them by hand. Like I have a decent technique of flipping them in. So I do, we have two sidelines here that go out. So I usually do the sidelines, start yelling, sideline, sideline. Like five days, you're like, oh yeah, I'm out here fishing. It's gonna be so fun. Such a nice trip. And after like, once you get to ten days, I'm like, oh, it's going slow. I want to go home. But then when it hits twenty days, I'm like, oh, this really sucks. <laughs> when am I gonna go home? I just want to go to sleep. On Lawrence's patio, the final tuna dish is almost ready.
Oh, so I want to show oh. the versatility of the albacore as well as the versatility of Ooh. the wine. So like that's a very European dish. This is a totally Asian dish. Soy, sesame, you know, seaweed. Uh, seaweed. So what I've done is I've, I've wrapped it with a little bit of macro kelp that, uh, that we get from Oceans Regenerative. Uh, seaweed company here here in British Columbia and seaweed just makes everything taste more like itself like it's not going to taste like it's going to enhance the flavor of the albacore and I'm curious to see your mouth feel and texture from that one to that same fish the only addition of a little bit of seaweed this crate wine liquidity it's a Viognier it's so versatile but it goes very well with like a denser seafood halibut tuna Okay, I want to make a toast. I really want to thank you guys. I want to thank fishermen from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Cheers. Ian. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wouldn't we, do you want to? I do. Thank you, Peter, thank Later. you. Let's just wait and see after they see the mess. <laughs> Here's to British Columbia. Yeah.